Hello, everybody, and welcome to an emergency podcast edition of Real Hawk Talk. I am Brian M. Hauser. You can find me on Twitter at Hawk Blogger. And folks, this is why. I mean, this is why. If you haven't already, click subscribe on the channel and click bell, the bell to get notified. This is why you do it, because you never know when Seahawks Twitter is going to start turning into the most effective paparazzi crew on the planet. Folks, we've got a new offensive coordinator. We have gone from the depths of Chip Kelly innuendo to the heights of Ryan Grubb, arguably the hottest offensive coordinator in college football, coming to Seattle to join the hottest defensive coordinator in the NFL, in Mike McDonald, to become the Wonder Twins for your Seattle Seahawks. And tonight we are couldn't even wait to talk about this. So I'm bringing in, first I got to go to Jeff Simmons in what is four minutes till midnight in Toronto. His, his poor... Uh, new bride, you know, hopefully she really knew what she was getting into when she signed up for this. Jeff, how are you doing, man? Oh, mute. Oh, I'm still not hearing you. Oh, okay, here we go. No, there you go. There it is. I had the mute button clicked. Um, I was, I was just talking to my wife before she was going to bed and I'm like, I'm going to be a while. She's like, what's happening? She's like, you're kind of pacing. I'm like, Scott's just hired a coach, and she's like, "So, I'm like, I'm gonna be <laughs> going on a podcast." And she was making fun of me about the concept of like our emergency podcasts. Yes, and so it's crazy. It's crazy because I have spent a disturbing amount of time refreshing Twitter this week. It's so true, <laughs> and like an alarming amount of time because the Seahawks have been crazy thorough with this. And, like, give them credit. They were thorough in getting McDonald. But, like, we haven't gone through this in, what, 30? Since any of us have been fans, really. And I spent so much time this week, like, looking at tweets one by one. It's like, when's there going to be some news? And then it happens to break at, like, midnight <laughs> on a Friday. So all the time I spend this week, I got to pay it back now. I'm, I am wouldn't be lying in bed, like, on my phone nonstop. So, it's pretty crazy because the big question with McDonald was, could he recruit an offensive coordinator? Who is it going to be? That was a big question in hiring him. And you guys are going to have a lot more insight on this guy, but this seems like as good a, and you're right. Like it looked pretty bleak the last couple of days. And Dan Quinn has started to hire a pretty good staff in Washington. And everyone's like, eh, and don't forget, they hired a defensive coordinator too today. So, but man, if you, McDonald just checked off every box and like the defensive staff has come along really nicely, but this seems, and it's been just a really fun night, just following those pictures and all and like figuring out that that was Schneider in the picture is we were having a good time with it. So I'm pretty pumped. Uh, we got a lot to break down. You are right. There's more news than just Ryan Grubb. Uh, but Derek, at D E R Y C K G underscore still, still rocking the underscore. Uh, you are a, not only a Seahawks fan, but a big Huskies fan. So I'm curious, how do you feel about this news, man? I am. I mean, I'm excited first and foremost, how confident I am. Maybe not overly confident. I think there we're going to get into this, but there's going to be some adjustments that Grubb will have to make with his offense compared to what it was last season and the season before at UW, you know, just changes from college to the pro game, but overall really excited. I think this process worked out quite interesting. It was obviously a long process, but it's kind of interesting. Grubb was maybe the first name mentioned, I think into the process. And then the week kind of went along and it was, is it Chip Kelly? Is it the Detroit passing game coordinator? And then we obviously saw today Chip Kelly took the Ohio State OC job, wasn't offered by the Seahawks. That came out as well. And so it seems like the Seahawks were just doing their due diligence as they did in the head coaching search as well and ended up with the guy they wanted. So, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
you step back and you look at this staff that's starting to come together. And I mean, the Leslie Frazier hire, I think was, uh, we haven't been on since that. I think that was a big deal and a huge get. Um, you already got Mike McDonald. You've now uh, added Ryan Grubb to it. Uh, and you got your OC, the the Brit um, uh, and former former defensive line coach for one of the best defensive line coaches in the NFL and Dan Quinn. Um, it's exciting. It's, it's, it's a interesting mix of backgrounds and experiences, uh, not to mention, you know, snagging Harbaugh's son and, and putting him in there at, at special teams coach. So it's, it's a, I don't know that there's a single hire that I look at so far and I'm like, Hey, what are they, what are they thinking there? Um, it, it feels, it feels like one brick after another in laying a really solid foundation. Um, now of course it could all blow over and just not work. Don't know, but it feels, as you said, Derek, and I think Jeff, you mentioned as well, this just feels like a logical, thoughtful, um, really solid process and a solid staff as a result. So I think the thing that I'm most excited about is what I talked to you guys early on is Dan Quinn. Part of the reason he said he was able to identify Kyle Shanahan when Kyle Shanahan wasn't the shit that he is now was because as a defensive play caller, he understood how hard it was to go up against Kyle Shanahan. He knew how to vet offensive coaches because he was a good defensive tactician. My hope was that Mike McDonald, who every like everybody from every corner says this guy is smart and an excellent tactician and has explored how offenses work and how to counter them, that if there's a guy to do a interview for an OC. I think he could be one of the best. And so if Ryan Grubb, who I already had respect for, went through that process, if he talked to the guy Tanner strand or whatever his name is from from detroit talk to chip kelly talk to whoever else and ryan grubb is the guy that ran the gauntlet and was able to answer the questions that mcdonald had and they were able to find some common ground and ways that they could go back and forth between offense and defense i love it i, I think this could be one of the most collaborative partnerships that we we see in the nfl I honestly, you don't see this very often um, where you've got a real up and comer on both sides of the ball. That That is not typical. Um, and I think by almost any account, Ryan Grubb fits that category. Um, so, uh, Derek, tell us a little bit more about you know, Grubb as a play caller. Like what, what, what do you, what do you identify having watched a bunch of different um, Huskies court, play callers over the years what made grub different yeah i would say i mean i made a tweet about this but get ready to learn a lot of passing the ball a lot of motion before the snap and during the snap they they would oftentimes line up in one way and then completely change it it was something that grub talked about using as a way to get information from the defense to line up in one way make an adjustment based on what he's seen you know all all in the same play so that's really unique. And then in the run game, kind of a mix of zone and gap concepts, which is a big change from what the Seahawks have had for the last however long, right? Obviously under Tom Cable, lots of inside zone, moving over to Andy Dickerson, bringing over the Ram scheme of that wide zone, outside zone kind of run game. We're going to see some some different stuff in the run in the run game. So a lot of pullers, guards, and tackles do a lot of pulling, need some athletes up front, uh, similar to Cable. Uh, I don't know if I should mention Tom Cable too much, but but uh, he wanted athletes, and, and I think that'll carry over here as well. In the passing game, I would look for a lot of vertical and deep routes, a lot of posts, but also a lot of crossers and screen game and mixing in that kind of short stuff to always give his QB op QB's option. Uh, that was one of the things that really impressed me the last two years with Penix was it seemed like he always had an option to go to. He would make his reads. He would, you know, sometimes he would hone in on one read, but he would always have a, have a check down to go to. And, and that really impressed me. Jeff, I, I mean, we can get back. I want to talk more, obviously, about Grub and the implications and all this. But I feel like we got to talk about the story around the story. 
Seahawks Twitter for a second. Yeah. And just like for folks that don't know, I, I mean, everyone on here probably does, but maybe people listening won't. I mean, I, I my inbox, my my DMs are lit up like a Christmas tree of people saying, "Hey, you forgot to mention that I was the person that that called. I told you yesterday that it was going to be grub." Like everyone believes that they called this. None of those people were the media. And I think we got to go back to a few days ago and what happened with the video that put, that came out about Grubb at, at Alabama and talking to the boosters. So talk people through that a little bit, the progression from there. It's been pretty crazy because I follow a lot of these coaching searches in the NFL. And usually there's like one of the beat writers that is like sort of on top of it the whole way. And like we've seen it with like the Panther search. They have one beat writer who's just the one who initially leaked the McDonald's news was one of our listeners the night we were doing a show, Whitney. And right. some people credited her. And the night we did our show where McDonald interviewed and we were people were following the planes. And that all started because Whitney tweeted out that Mc, she had heard from a friend that McDonald was the guy and he was flying the day of the interview when we were a little nervous that the plane had left. So she's the one who broke the McDonald's story. That came out through, like, the national guys the next day. And that's pretty crazy enough to begin with. That, like, one of our listeners, one of our regulars that we actually saw when we were in town for that. Yep. We saw Wendy at the game, and she was awesome, friendly. Then today, we start hearing from all different people from, like, UW handles and UW Twitter. And there was the one, like, bet the over, I think it's, or take the over. Take the over. Yeah, take the we'll over. Take the, was, over. The, take the over was the first one, and that was pretty early. That was like three o'clock Pacific time, or like pretty it's early. This afternoon, afternoon, for sure. And they said Ryan Grubb's going to be the coach, and then more UW accounts. I gotta pause you there because there, I, I've got a few people that legitimately have gripes that that I don't know gripes, but that they said something before and I didn't mention them. So Noah Gargile. G A R G U I L E at N O A H G A R G U I L E. He is the first person I saw that posted that there was a grub sighting at the VMAC. This was oh yeah. This was earlier this morning. He was he was un, he was displeased that I did not give him credit. Okay, um, sorry, Noah. My my. But funny enough, <laughs> UW uh, commenter who was the one who broke all those pictures tonight. Yes. He just posted a selfie with him and McDonald. Yes. I don't yep. know if you saw yep. that. And then apparently Schneider was mad. He took a picture of him too. Yes. But yeah, it started with Noah started. There was buzz that the grub was at the VMAC today. And then a lot of these UW accounts that you two are probably more familiar with than me started tweeting out, okay, this is happening. And then everything really broke when that first picture came out of them at Dino's, which is the bar right near the VMAC. And the funny part is from certain angles, you could see McDonald, you could see Grubb, but we had a debate internally whether that was Schneider. And we're not going to get into why some of us didn't think it was. Hey, hey, hey I, I will own it. I was like, hey, I think John's a little thicker than that, man. I don't know from that angle. Those those legs look pretty skinny. So I got to I gotta give credit to, to John. I mean, John's clearly been hitting the elliptical. You know, he's he's toned up. So good for him, dude. He he uh, he fooled me on that one. Yeah, and I'm sitting there like analyzing his hair and his shirt and <laughs> – I figured out about the linebacker coach. But you nailed it. The new pictures are coming. That out was like, that was impressive. That was freaking impressive. Was. We were like, okay, we can, this blurry picture. We we're all like, okay, is there any way that this is a fake or this is from another time? Derek's like, no, there's no way. There's a blurred picture. <laughs> Mike McDonald is like, no way. And I'm like, no. Like from what I know, I work for Adobe. I did a lot of stuff with content authenticity and Photoshop. I'm like, this would be a really tough one to fake. And, and I was like looking at the, anyway, it doesn't matter. I was looking at all the, the raw data and, and, and then through this blurry picture, you can kind of make it a couple faces and Jeff's like, oh yeah, he comes back five minutes later, three minutes later. I think that's the new linebackers coach. Like <laughs> what kind of like Google image savant are you? To, like, well, they've only hired like three guys. So <laughs> I just look, I know what Leslie Frazier looks like. That's who I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it was not him. I know, like maybe it's like the there's a, the trainer EK. Like I was thinking it might be him. Like that. Yeah, and it was not Aiden Dirty. No, Aiden is that Dirty. How you his last name. Is it? There dirty? was a lot of like so, riding dirty <laughs> jokes going around. Today. There's a lot of dirty like that. There's a lot you can do with that. I like that. But like that the pictures like and then you saw the actual picture of Schneider's face and Grub and 
McDonald. And the fact that he got a selfie with him, just kudos to that guy. You'd have commenter. That, that was that was pretty sweet. And then it was hilarious because I mean, I knew it, as soon as I saw the picture, I knew exactly where they were. And I'm I'm not far from Dino's, and I'm like, if Rachel wasn't out and, and I wasn't watching our, our our kid at home, I would have been in the car, and I just would have been like, I would have driven down there. But apparently, other people took that on themselves because all of a sudden we started getting these like, it was like one of those like uh, 360 degree cameras that like take pictures <laughs> of all sides of somebody for like a 3D image. Like all of a sudden, there's just angles coming, and I, I just imagine Schneider looking up and just seeing all these like phones popping up. Uh, he's like, Pearson's gonna kill those guys. I, I swear to God, I know everyone thinks that they did this intentionally, and <laughs> it's possible. I really don't think they did. I think they're just excited. Yeah, I I think that, and, and I don't think they're on Twitter. I, like they might have burner accounts, but I don't think they're on there checking all the time. I think they were having beers, enjoying the moment, and excited. And <laughs> you know. I, I kind of love that that's the way it happened. And I could, I've been in the situation you'd have a commenter was where you then get the angry call from Dave Pearson or from Schneider or whoever, like what the hell you cannot be tweeting that. Um, Cause they've got, they've, not only do they want the news break, but they've got these relationships with other credentialed media that they have deals with to tell these things too and so i mean freaking you dumb commenter and all these other people are scooping adam schefter you know all the local reporters it's crazy it's, it's wild it's, it's i mean i love it like that was like the energy twitter used to have like for sure yeah that's been both the big hires have come from seahawks twitter which is are you dumb twitter which is unbelievable i can't remember any other situation like that it's just it's crazy because where I live in Toronto, like Brian, you're in New York a lot. Yeah. Toronto's a lot like New York. Like it's such like a crazy media market. It's so like a GM of a team would never, never be out for a beer in a public place. Yeah. They have to be so secretive. And for that just to come out and like someone was tweeting that like if you go to like talk to the waitresses about some stories there, like they have incredible Seahawks stories. So yeah, for people that don't know, Dino's Pub is directly across the highway from the VMAC. It is a two-minute like drive from the VMAC, and it is a place where a lot of Seahawks folks hang out. Um, it's a lot of where a lot of media hangs out. A lot of Seahawks reporters hang out there too. So, um, it's not uncommon for Seahawks staff to be there. Coaches, not players usually. Um, so. Anyway, crazy, crazy to see that. Derek, I'm curious. I mean, uh, there was also a, a conversation a few days ago about Grubb doing that. Um, I don't know if it was a press conference or a speech in front of the, the Bama boosters. And we were kind of debating in our chat about, like, is this meaningful or is it not? What do you think? Like, what's your read of how this like that's how this unfolded now that you know it's where it ended up yeah. like what's your read of what happened there well so let's just go over the timeline of of grub real quick so kaylin DeBoer takes the alabama job it's rumored within a couple days that ryan grub will probably go with them it came out during the uw coaching search ryan grub posted the statement himself said he wanted to be the next coach at uw he wasn't chosen i think uw just chose to go with an outside outside guy so Grubb took to Twitter and, and posted himself that that he really wanted to be the next head coach, but he wasn't being chosen and just said onwards to the next thing without specifically stating Alabama. It was rumored kind of throughout January and now into February that it would be Ryan Grubb, but there was never any official announcement from Alabama. Ryan's Grubb, Ryan Grubb's Twitter profile stayed neutral. No Alabama Photoshop, no nothing in the bio saying Alabama OC. Uh, and then, of course, the Seahawks rumors kind of get going after McDonald is hired that that he'll be a candidate. Uh, and then it kind of goes dark for a few days. And Ryan Grubb pops up at this Alabama booster meeting, which, you know, is not officially part of Alabama's football. So I think it's OK for him to be there. Uh, but there haven't been any pictures, to my knowledge, of him being in Alabama and no confirmation from Alabama that Ryan Grubb was officially the offensive coordinator yet. But I think him being in Tuscaloosa kind of gave a hint that, hey, that's where this thing is headed. 
And now that the Seahawks were kind of interviewing other candidates, we mentioned Chip Kelly and, and Engstrand, there were rumors that maybe some other guys were getting it looks as well. The ship seemed to be sailing a little bit on Grubb. Now, I know, Brian, you, you weren't quite convinced. I wasn't entirely ruling it out, but I thought it just kind of tipped the scale towards Alabama. He's there. They're interviewing other candidates. So I thought it started to look unlikely. And then the Chip Kelly thing comes out this morning, and it's kind of like, hmm, well, there's one option off the table, and the Seahawks didn't make an offer. Engstrand is, has been available since Sunday, so it's not been an offer there. So maybe Grubb is back on the table. And here we are at 9 p.m., and Grubb's the new offense coordinator. It's <laughs> Brian, you, you yeah. had this guy as like when Pete was like, we were talking about Pete not coming back or maybe not coming back. This is a guy you said you wanted as a head coach, right? I was, yeah. I mean, I, I'll own that. I mean, I, be, <laughs> I sorry, I'm, I'm still looking at Twitter while we're talking. Uh, if you haven't seen it, the Seahawks Twitter account eight minutes ago posted a tweet of beers clinking together. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That guy's a I love it. Love it. Um, so, yeah, here's my line of thought is all right, we're throwing, we're, we want, offensive names likely that's where we want to try to go like that's the even john indicated that's kind of what he was looking for and i'm like who are the the best offensive names we talked about the the nfl options and slowick and um johnson and and so forth i didn't think that the list was that long in the nfl and, and necessarily like that overwhelming and i've been really impressed with grub like i thought I got slammed by Huskies fans when I was like, I was, I thought he was a good head coaching candidate for them. Like I, I, I had quite like in my mind, he demonstrated such an advantage on the offensive side of the ball and how he called plays and how he um, built an offensive line and how he accentuated the, the, the players that they had on that team from receivers to quarterback to running backs that like that's pretty durable and, and everyone's like well he doesn't have recruiting he doesn't have to recruit and i'm like sure fine but i think talent follows talent and so in my mind i think the huskies missed potentially a, a pretty big opportunity i think ryan grubb is a more unique coaching talent than jed fish like and i don't want to turn this into a huskies pod but i'm just like i think ryan grubb is a unique play calling talent I think he elevates players. I think he has um, a good mix in the way he calls plays. I think he calls NFL level passing offense where you're having to make throws that, sorry, actually there's a lot of NFL players that aren't making the throws that he asked Michael Penix to make last year and the year before. So um, yeah, in my mind, I was like, yeah, that that could be a guy um, that, that deserves some consideration, but it would have been a big leap. And so I am, 10 times more excited a hundred times more excited about the combination of Mike McDonald and Ryan Grubb than I would have been about Ryan Grubb and you know whoever defensively I think the next name that I'm kind of curious about and we don't have to go super deep on this is on the offensive line side and Derek I don't know if you can talk a little bit about there's some rumors that this might be more than Grubb coming this way and that the offensive line coach might be coming with with him yeah, so Scott Huff was, I think, the coordinator, the excuse me, the offensive line coach for seven the past seven seasons at UW. Uh, was a Boise State coach before then, so coach under Chris Peterson before he came to UW, and then a couple of years later joined joined the staff, Peterson staff. Um, he's put together really solid O lines, uh, including a few draft picks. Uh, they'll probably have a couple more this year. You know, uh, excuse me, Troy Fautanu probably a first rounder or second rounder this year. Roger Rosengarten really impressed last week at the senior bowl. will be an offensive tackle, maybe a day two guy. We go back a few years. Caleb McGarry was a first round pick for the Falcons. Uh, Nick Harris also went to the Browns as a draft pick. So he's, he's produced NFL quality offensive linemen. He's, he was the run game coordinator for a few years as well. So if that's a position that Grubb is looking to fill, he can do that. Um, the other guy, we didn't mention yet is Jamarcus Shepard, wide receiver coach at UW, also moved over to Alabama. He was the passing game coordinator at UW, which could be a position Brian Grubb is also looking to fill. 
Um, I would say he may be an OC candidate for Alabama. There were already some, a lot of Husky fans actually, and Husky players even, that were banging the table for Shepard to to be a head coach candidate when when the Washington job opened. So he's kind of highly thought of, but I think that would be certainly be a name to look at also on the offensive staff. I mean, Jeff, what have you and I talked about over and over and over again? Offensive yeah. line, defensive <laughs> line, right? Yeah. And in, in, in the course of a day, you get a defensive line coach as your new DC. And then you get an offensive coordinator who's a former offensive line coach and potentially his offensive line coach who helped build one of the better Huskies offensive lines in the last decade, two decades, you know, like it's been a while since the Huskies have had an offensive line as good as, as you know, this one was, um, am I right? Is that the, is that the next biggest domino to fall here is offensive line coach? Everyone is talking about the name Derek just said, I, I saw some like the national college guys. I think Adam Rittenberg is one who said, by far the most likely coach to go with him is the offensive line coach. There are questions about whether the next coach and who the passing game coordinator is going to be or who the running run game coordinator is going to be, because that's really like has been the question with Grubb is a def- defensive coach typically like to hire the run the football, protect. That's not what they did here. So that is not how they did things. So that's going to the offensive line coach is pretty seems like all the Alabama people are saying like they never left their houses in Seattle. Like they're, I think that offensive line coach seems like a pretty big lock, especially losing Dickerson. I think the, like the pass game coordinator will be interesting. I think who the running back coach will be, will be really interesting. And if they bring in a run game coordinator, but it's just, it's so fascinating because you, he really talked about someone who's more of an architect who's going to build an yeah. offense. Yeah. And, not a guy who just can run a scheme and an old guy who ran a scheme. And uh, I'm just so curious of how their process was where he did seem initially like the guy who was favored, man. Maybe they just want to say, okay, we got to make sure that there's no one out there better. And they talked to the Detroit guy who had multiple interviews. He, I think he interviewed with new England and Tampa and didn't get any of those jobs. So maybe he's lacking something. The Chip Kelly thing came out this week. Apparently there was a lot more. They had to interview at least one minority candidate. And there was Eric B enemy talk this week. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they end up basically where they started, which is kind of how the head coaching search went. It's been interesting. Been interesting. It's just obviously the big question now is Michael Penix. Yeah, let's go there. Let's go there. I mean, that's, that's the, the logical evolution here. You know, if you just want to tie things together, I've been tweeting it because, you know, I'd be happy about it, but, but I know not everyone feels the same way, but let's, let's also be honest. I mean, uh, Pete Carroll, when he came out first draft Seahawks desperately needed a safety. Everybody was like Taylor Mays. He's going to take his guy, Taylor Mays, Seattle ties, Pete Carroll ties. They're taking him. What'd they do at 14? They took Earl Thomas. Taylor Mays wasn't even like, you know, they, they, they weren't going to take him and partially because they knew him really well. And so I think there's absolutely a case to be made that Ryan Grubb knows Michael Penix better than anybody else that's going to be in, you know, considering him for the NFL. No, no. And that could mean he's going to really pound the table. And so you got to get this guy and he's worth like, I want to build my offense with this guy. Or it could be, you know what? this is a guy that we could we could wait on or there's another guy I'd be more interested in or whatever else. I think both of those are very, I do not assume that this just means Michael Penix. I'm curious, Derek, if, if, if you feel the same way. Yeah, I wouldn't jump to conclusions that it's Michael Penix. I mean, they still have the Geno decision to make that's coming up in a few weeks. Are they going to trade? I, I don't think a cut is on the table. I think it would have to be a trade or or keep them. Um, so we'll have to see where that goes. And yeah, if they decide to trade, then I think Michael Penix becomes a very real possibility at, at pick number sixteen. And if obviously, you, we'll to, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I'm going to say the thing that's really interesting now. If you see the staff kind of come together, 
one of Pete's strengths when he first got to the NFL was the intel he had on the college football classes. That was a huge part of those early drafts where they pulled Sherman, they made Daryl Thomas pick. If you look at what the staff has now, Mike McDonald was in Michigan two years ago. Grubb has been in college with UW. They're going to bring in more guys. Jay Harbaugh was at Michigan. So they're going to have really good intel on J.J. McCarthy. They're Mm -hmm. going to have really good intel on Penix. And if you think of Harbaugh's coached a ton of Jay, it's weird calling him Harbaugh, but he's coached (laughs) a ton of different positions. So they're going to know Michigan. They're going to know that conference. And then they got the the Washington guys. Like that is going to be a huge competitive advantage for this team where there's guys coming up from Michigan up front and there's guys on both sides of the ball. And they've really, they really lost that one. Pete kind of three years after Pete kind of lost the college pool. I think this is going to be a huge competitive intelligence thing for the staff. Yeah. Is there other than maybe Harbaugh in the chargers, is there any other staff that could make the case that they are, they have more insight into current college prospects than the Seahawks staff. I mean, I can't think of anybody. And it would just, and Harbaugh's guys are all not. Michigan guys. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have to assume Harbaugh at Michigan for as, as long as he was. And as, as a big time program that he's got a ton of Intel, you know, across, across uh, college prospects. But I think offensively, defensively, different parts of the country, different prospects. I think you can make the case the Seahawks cover cover the spectrum a little bit more than uh, than anyone else. And yeah, I think that's a big deal. Derek, do you remember what what Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb in, in unison did when they first got? To UW, what were their what, what were their first priorities? Was was Michael Penix their first transfer? Like, was that the big thing? Did they did they re did they bring in linemen? Like, what was their? Do you remember the priority? Linemen, of- no. So, so they came in. The transfer portal was not. I mean, it wasn't as big when they first came in as it is even now, just two years later. It also wasn't as bad of a situation. Not as many guys left. Oh, the O line coach they kept, Scott Huff, that we mentioned before. He, he, he stayed through uh, the coaching change, so that helped retain a lot of offensive linemen. They didn't really need to recruit anyone there. So, yeah, Penix was definitely, I think, the number one priority. And, you know, some stuff came out that as soon as he went into the transfer portal, because Grubb, or excuse me, DeBoer had coached him for a season at Indiana when DeBoer was the offensive coordinator, they were instantaneous. They said that as soon as Michael Penix came into the portal, there was no, there was no waiting. They instantly contacted him, instantly got him out for a visit, and wrapped it up right there. So, it was, it was the QB, and then also recruiting the receivers. And we haven't even talked about the receivers yet. Um, a lot of those guys, both Jalen McMillan and Romo Dunze, who's probably a top ten pick, were planning on entering the transfer portal. And Grubb's job was to watch film with them for the first ten days that he was in Seattle every day and try to convince them to stay at UW. And ultimately they did. Turned out to be a good decision for the both of them. They'll probably be – McMillan will probably be a day two pick. Polk will probably be a day two pick. And Odunze clearly a first rounder. So who do you think – who do you think is most excited on who, – who should be most excited on the Seahawks <laughs> roster? Not who they're going to pick, but who should be most excited about this? JSN, the, did you hear him talk the, about the, the guy that oh, dogged Waldron. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, they got a lot of Michigan guys, right? They got a lot of Michigan guys now. Fill, yeah, fill people in, Jeff, on on the JSN story. Who has not been following along on Twitter? So JSN clearly went down to Vegas to do some promotional stuff this week, and he he did a couple different things. Him and Chris Olave were going around the radio row or whatever, and he ended up doing like either a bounty ad or something like that with a couple of Chicago guys and they they're all excited. They're they're like, all right, JSN, like tell us about our new OC Shane Waldron. And he pauses and he goes, uh, is this live? <laughs> and he literally <laughs> said that. <laughs> and then gives like the like the worst like stamp of approval I've ever heard. <laughs> but yeah, he's a really nice guy. Like I liked him and then he like then like the light switch comes on and he starts like trying to act like a professional. Then the next day he does another one 
he still doesn't. He, he like he, he does a better job at the front and like, but still is like cannot say anything about him as an offensive coach. I did possibly. not see the second one. It happened again. Oh, it happened again. And and was... and like he got he, he was trying to get through it and then he just puts his head in his hands and his the guy sitting next to him like oh, starts no. laughing and puts his hand on his shoulder. <laughs> it was bad. It well, was let me bad. just explain why Jason may be excited. So Jalen McMillan was kind of the slot guy for UW last two se- last two seasons, but he still ran an expensive route tree. Oh, it was right. not yeah. 40 screen passes. You know, which I think probably is is part of Jason's unhappiness, uh, which obviously has to do with the O line and how they want to scheme up quick game. But I think Jason coming in as a first round pick, fifteen hundred yards his sophomore season at Ohio State was probably looking to to have a bigger role in the offense. So Jason should be excited that his OC will not limit him to to <laughs> to screen passes. Yeah, I I think he and DK Metcalf are the two two people that came to mind for me. I mean, DK Metcalf, you know, I think there's a case to be made that Roman Dunze does some things in contested catches that DK Metcalf hasn't done as consistently. Yeah. But, you know, Grubb found ways to get the ball in their hands. I think the other people that have reason to be excited are the running backs. Uh, Dylan Johnson, he's a fine back. I don't think he's a great back. He's got great heart, runs hard. Um they found ways to to work him in. They absolutely would feed the running back at times. Sometimes I, if there is a flaw that I've seen from Ryan Grubb, it is that he can become too run centric. He can get into like a little bit of a, ru- a run rut. Um, and I mean, I like the fact that he, he, he balances his offense, but he can kind of get stuck there. But the point is, he likes to run the ball and he's willing to run the ball. And I think they run the ball pretty well off the pass. And so look, how many times have we talked about how friggin' frustrating it is to feel like the run game and the pass game are not working in, in, in synchronicity. Like they're just not working together and they feel almost like they're battling each other and it never feels logical when this is happening versus that. I think there's a decent chance for this to be a little more harmonious and, and a little bit like complimentary and man, I mean, it'd be nice to see. And if we could just get, if we could just get a defense that isn't the worst in the fricking NFL. And I, I don't know guys, I don't think that Mike McDonald is going to put out a defense that is the bottom third in the league. No. I don't think he's going to do that. So I agree. So the Seahawks have just become so much more interesting. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable. Like, I I can't wait to like to see it. What the, what the rest of the offseason looks like. This was a team that was just spinning in circles, going nowhere, with the most boring coaching staff imaginable. This has been a delight. I mean, I I can't go ahead, Derek. Well, I was just gonna say, you know, I, I think. There's some adjustments Grubb will need to make moving to the NFL. Probably needs to go more under center. Probably can't take so many deep shots in the game. But I think there's a lot more versatility in this offense than than it's given credit for. Michael Penix was not a particularly mobile, although I think he's maybe more mobile than he's let on given his injury history. Uh, I think there's a whole package of plays that they can have with a more mobile QB. Now, is Gino that that guy? Probably not at this stage of his career. But it, if – you know, if and when it's not Geno, they get a more mobile, mobile guy. I think there's lots of versatility that can happen in this offense. Is there is there like an offensive scheme in the NFL that reminds you not not like that they're identical, but is is sim like if I was to give you you know some of the the most uh, referenced offensive play callers, you got Andy Reid, you've got Sean McVay, you've got Kyle Shanahan. Um, you know, Mike McDaniel, who's, you know, uh, offshoot of that. Are there any of those guys offenses that, that, that seems more similar to what grub runs? Maybe, maybe Mike McDaniel. Uh huh. Just in the sense that I think he creates easier reads for Tua than maybe some of the other guys. And for Penix in the last, two seasons, I would say there's a decent amount of kind of one read, one read, one, two read looks that make it really easy for the quarterback to dissect what's going on, where he's going to go, 
and it all happens in a fast mo- manner. And this is what helped Penix only get sacked nine times or 10 times mm-hmm. last season. And the offensive line of UW, while they have great players, I think they were also helped by a scheme that the mm-hmm. quarterback was getting the, the ball out of his hands quickly and not allowing, you know, four or five seconds to happen where the QBs going to, going to take more hits. So, yeah, I mean, I could say it is definitely not like McVay's. I mean, McVay's yeah. is a very, very system, like predictable how it, it how it looks. It's not like that. It's not like Shanahan's. Shanahan's is like the run game is very different. That is a much more run oriented offense. Um, a lot more. I mean, tacking the middle of the field specifically a lot. I mean, Grub has that, but not like that. There is some resemblance for me with Andy Reid, his his variety of play calls. Like there's screen game, there's there's some deep stuff, there's a good mix of run and pass. I probably there's some would trick have, plays. There which are Andy Reid is also not also not afraid of. I mean, I'm not saying he's Andy Reid, so everybody just calm down. <laughs> just calm down. But I'm just saying of those guys, that's the one that there's there's some resemblance to me. Um in how he, his offense kind of kind of looks. Um, so how do you think the conversation is going to go when the Seahawks get to the 16th pick in the first round and Mike McDonald is Mike McDonald going to be pounding the table for his def- for a defensive guy? Is he going to feel like, Hey, I'm the new head coach. And I want to defer to my offensive guy that I brought aboard because I want to help him succeed. Is John going to go in there and he's going to say, no, we're just taking the best player. How is that? Like, how do you think that's going to unfold? Go ahead, Jeff. (laughs) Well, they're going to spend a lot of time talking quarterbacks. Yeah. Um, Again, they have the whole Penix versus McCarthy inside the building with the Michigan Washington thing is just so fascinating. So I think they're going to a lot of time going through scenarios, especially if they do have interest in those two guys. And that might be a trade up kind of thing. That might be a small, because there's clearly it's kind of the way the drafts kind of broken down. There's the tier clear tier one of quarterbacks. And those two guys are the clear tier two with Bo Nix, who I don't, I don't think had a great senior bowl. And then there's the whole offensive line thing where they're going to have, they have a clear glaring hole and it fits everything McDonald talked about it. You can't really have a weak offensive line and play the way he wants to play. And then on defense, there's going to be guys we've talked about Jared verse. We've talked about Mm -hmm. like how perfect is Jared verse for Mike McDonald's defense. And we've talked about like Newton from uh, Indiana, uh, from Illinois. And we talked about the other, who's the Murphy Murphy from from Texas. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. So God, they're going to be, There's going to be a lot of people pulling in different, but I think so much of it's going to have to come down to it starts with the quarterback. Like if Gino's the guy for the year, if not, I think the quarterback will take priority because I think they're going to have so much information on those guys, or maybe it's a move down, but man, that first pick is going to be so fascinating now. And it stinks. They don't have a second rounder. This year's draft's gone. Apparently it just completely sucks on day three because everyone went back to college. Apparently like, I heard someone say like everyone with day three picks should just trade them for next year's like because yeah. of NIL like everyone went back. So man, these next few weeks are going to be interesting with like what happens with Leonard Williams and do they make a move on Lockett and but that first pick I have no fucking clue. I think it's going to be so interesting because there's three clear areas this could go. Derek, do you have a do you have a guess? No, I'm with Jeff. I I would have to say interior D line would would have to be. Number one, if a guy like, sorry, what's the guy from Texas? Murphy. Murphy? Yeah. Murphy, yeah. I, think. No, I just, I think that's there. Obviously, if Gino is is traded or, or something like that happens, then obviously quarterback needs to take priority. But I would, I would strongly think that that John is inclined to to help out McDonald's side of the football first. Yeah. Would you guys if? Would you guys be in favor of them trading trading picks from next year to get into the second round this year or even to get into the a second first round this year? Uh for a quarterback, 
Yeah, I'll, yeah, that's how I feel. I'll give up almost anything for a quarterback if if you know Gino's not the guy and they they decide they need someone. Sure. Yeah. And they got the other two than three. that, no. They have the two threes, but you're missing the second this year. I just feel like yeah, don't stop putting yourself stop year. putting yourself behind the eight ball and just have a reset. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, for people that don't know, uh, Alabama fans are not taking the news well. <laughs> they have edited Ryan Grubb's Wikipedia page. It now reads as follows. Uh, Ryan Grubb, born April 16th, 1976, is an American football coach and circus clown, who is the offensive oh. coordinator and quarterbacks coach for the Seattle Seahawks, meaning that he now has to coach Geno Smith and Drew Locke instead of the superior Jalen Milrow. Well, I see something that is maybe, well, it says he's a snake. Uh, they and must be close. editing it uh, and <laughs> I haven't refreshed. And, and, and he's close friends with some not good people. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? To the losers go the losing. So uh, enjoy. I mean, Bama's had plenty of winning for a long time. They are going to face, uh, uh, you know, going from yeah. Nick Saban to, the sh to, to, to like Kalen DeBoer and then losing a coach again, maybe multiple coaches, that doesn't happen to Alabama. No. <laughs> so they're not going to handle it very well. And you know what? I don't really give a shit. Um, he's, he's turned them I'll down just... twice. What's that? He turned them down twice. Saban tried to hire him last year. That's right. All right. Right. That's right. That's right. And I think this search, just going back to the kind of the search, I think it speaks highly of Grubb that they interviewed him first. And then wanted to get a full picture, two, three, four other guys, including multiple guys with NFL experience. Chip Kelly, obviously, as a head coach for four or five years. Engstrand's been the Detroit passing game coordinator. And Grubb stood out ahead of them after a week of doing interviews. I think that speaks quite highly of Grubb. I do, too. Uh, I mean, she come as no surprise to people that, that Hugh Millen – uh, softy, uh, you know, think that think very, very highly of of Ryan Grubb. Um, I think everybody that knows him does. I mean, the only person that I'm other than Bama fans, uh, Jim Moore, the Coog, uh, who just you know is going to be salty. He's out here tweeting about it'll be hard to pull for a guy who flat out lied to Alabama fans this week. It's always about me, 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 and the hell with everyone else. Handshake agreements and someone's words should mean something, but apparently they don't anymore. That's... I think he's. I think he's just trolling. What was oh, yeah. he supposed uh, to say? He's salty. What's the guy uh, supposed also, to do? I, I mean, I, yeah. Did he know in the back of the mind this in the back of his mind this was a possibility? Sure, but two days ago when he said that, I don't think he had the job offer. Me either. How many times, I mean, you guys have worked in different places. How many times have you told your employer and your coworkers that you're interviewing for a new job and plan to take it if they offer it to you before it actually happens? Have you ever done that? No, you couldn't. They it's fired a fucking you. ridiculous thing to expect anybody to do. That's not how professional life works. No, I so, just went through like the same sort of thing where I was at a – I left my old job. I got a new job, but I, I, I left after five, six months because I got a much better offer. And look, my old company was pissed, but like, I wasn't going to tell them I'm looking for work. <laughs> That's not, I mean, it's, it's, this is the way of the world. And, and guess what? The Seahawks will fire him like that if he's not good at his job. So you got to, like, this is a chance to coach in the NFL for a team that is in the same area where you live and love to live for the last few years. Like whatever, man, anyone that's, that's, that's casting a shadow on this, you know, I got no time for that, but yeah. yeah. Chad fish left Arizona when a better job came up. Like, yeah. I'm, I, my question with Jed Fish is like, when is the tan going to fade? I mean, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot be a Seattle coach and be like that level he's, of tan. He yeah. said he's going to continue wearing the visor, though. <laughs> okay, sure. Which will be interesting. Sure, he will. I'll, I'll give him like one game at Husky Stadium, and that thing is going to be gone. <laughs> um, 
All right. Well, it is it is almost one in the morning for you, Jeff. What else? Anything else that we should cover before we uh, we uh, let you get some some rest? Just uh, I told you guys these jobs, the Seahawks jobs were desirable. Uh, there was a lot of people, uh, certain people clowning that, but they pulled what they outbid Washington with the rich new ownership to get Mike McDonald. That story to come out. And when Rappaport put out the tweet today that they've hired this guy, he called it a major recruiting win for Mike McDonald. And Albert Breer said teams have tried to poach this guy in the past. They've been studying his offense. This is a big win for Mike McDonald because, again, the big question with him was who's the offensive coordinator going to be? Does he have the relationships? And I think the fact that he landed with Schneider I think is huge. I think you can see the two of them, they have different relationships and – the fact that Grubb obviously must have known Schneider really well. I wonder if that more came from Schneider or that came because they, there was a lot of talk that they were going to hire Mike Kafka if the Giants didn't block them. Mm-hmm. So don't know if Grubb or Kafka, how that would have shook it out. But I think I think the Seahawks ended up in a much better situation, to be honest. Yeah, Kafka was uh, Schneider a beer. He got him a nice yeah. big promotion and raise. Yeah, so. we should have brought Kafka there. We could have used some uh, memes of him. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, uh, yeah, I mean, my last question, maybe uh, famous last words, but what have we learned through this process? Because I got a few things that come to mind. I mean, I'll give you some examples. Like, we didn't know if Jody Allen and Burt Cold we're going to be willing to even walk away from Pete Carroll and his $15 million contract if they were planning to sell. Well, they walked away from him. And maybe that was an indication that they were planning, not planning to sell. Maybe it was just an indication that they care enough that they're going to, they're not going to be just caretaker, you know, kind of owners um, and, and execs. Then John Schneider gets to run this, this coaching search and he lands arguably the number one coaching prospect in the entire NFL um, by most, like whatever you consider him independence coaching rankings, Mike McDonald's top of the top of the heap um, Jim Harbaugh in some cases, but a lot of people have have McDonald. So you, you, you see John Schneider do this. You also see the ownership then pay him a significant people are reporting up to $9 million. Well, it's so, the highest paid, highest paid for a first time head coach. Right. And a six year deal. And then you see them land the number one offensive coordinator in college football. And I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. At, he has a pretty big buyout, if I remember, like a couple million bucks. I yeah. Well, what, he was, I think he was number one or number two highest paid coordinator in college football last season before he supposedly took a job at Alabama. Yeah, I mean, you don't. I mean, I know he's a very loyal dude. You don't turn down a job at Alabama two years in a row and not get money. So, I don't know. Like, I think I think we learned a lot about Jody Allen, Burt Cold. I think we learned a lot about John Schneider. I think we learned a lot about you know Mike McDonald. Um, and I got a ton of just vicious shit when i tweeted on the day that the pete carroll news came out that i appreciated that jody allen and burt cold did what was a really tough thing and i think that a lot of folks are still are still waiting for this to fail because they were so pissed that 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 pete carroll got let go i just think this demonstrates like a high bar and a real commitment to trying to do something well and this could have so easily been, you know, pick a, an uninspiring hire. I mean, we've, we've used the Dan Quinn, Chip Kelly thing. I mean, if this was Dan Quinn and Cliff Kingsbury, um, the difference between that and this for me is pretty significant. Like, I don't know that, it, I don't know that we could have been in a better position than we are, are right now, um, given what these folks do. So what do you feel like? What is your assessment? What have you learned about the decision makers uh, all and up and up and down the the, the Seahawks? What well, I think you nailed the two things. The, the first was, yeah, I was thinking the whatever special tax on the Seahawks stadium expires this spring, May, I think. And I was thinking, well, they'll probably just stick with what they have 
they'll sell in the summer, the fall, whenever, and move on. I think you you said it right that they aren't just caretakers, that they're here to win. And yeah, they'll probably sell within a couple of years, whatever, whatever the however that may be. Uh, and the second thing was I was really impressed with John and conducting a thorough search. My, you know, fears and not that I think Dan Quinn would have been a bad hire or, you know, an outrageous thing to do. But my fear was he was going to interview the minimum candidates he had to and then hire someone he knew. He conducted a very thorough search, even waited. You know, they were basically done interviewing and then had to wait for the AFC championship to, to play out before he could hire McDonald and then made the decision quickly. It was really probably one interview and he decided, yeah, this is the guy. And we see it again now on the offensive coordinator. He doesn't let McDonald hire whoever. It's, you know, probably a joint process hired that we know of at least three people, probably, you know, a fourth, if you want to count Kafka and rumored to be more. So very thorough search. He got, you know, maybe I would say maybe the number two head coach, Ben Johnson was very highly sought after, you know, going into the process and out of the OC candidates that are available. Yeah. I think I'd take Grubb probably over anyone. So we got some news. Okay. Adam Rittenberg, who is the ESPN college football writer, says, here's what I'm hearing on Alabama staff. Scott Huff is expected to join the Seahawks. He is the online coach. As Derek pointed out, Jamarcus Shepard and Nick Sheridan are both likely to stay in Alabama as co-OCs. Sheridan could be play caller and move to QBs as well. So Interesting. That was that was a rumor earlier when it first when whoever started the first rumor of Huff and Shepard leaving was that Sheridan could be a name to watch uh, as being promoted at Alabama. So interesting that Shepard looks like he's going to stay there. Throw it in the chat. And I I think this is a challenge. This is one one other thing I want to talk about was I think this is a challenge for Grubb to put together this offensive staff. Not that he doesn't know anyone, but he has been in the NFL A and B. He's been with DeBoer for all except two years, I believe, when DeBoer went to Indiana, and I think DeBoer's first year uh, at Fresno State, he was not with him. So Grubb, I don't think, has an extensive coaching network, and we'll see where this goes. Hopefully maybe John can can lean on his on some of his contacts to help round out the staff. Um, so. Well, let's, let's, be, let's be clear, though. I mean, at least this is my th- – having watched different groups come in to Seahawks, uh, different coaching staffs year after, you know, over, over many years, there's a big, big difference in the importance of different coaches on your staff. And I think I wouldn't say the only thing that matters here, but the, by far the biggest thing is landing the O-line coach because after the OC, the O-line coach is the next most important. And it's not even like you could say on the defensive side, the defensive coordinator and then the defensive line coach or the secondary coach. And to some extent that can be true, but people forget when Pete Carroll came and and then you had Daryl Bevel eventually and Tom Cable eventually. Tom Cable ran, he called the running plays. He wasn't just like they split play calling duties. It was a mess in some ways, but it, it worked out. Um, how the offensive line coach selects his offensive lineman and how, what kind of run game is he, you know, power is he, is he a trap guy? Is he a zone guy, whatever. And how that works with the offensive coordinator play calls that often takes a little while to actually like mesh and to feel right. And so when you have a guy, two guys that have already been working together and know how each other work and know what they like to do and know how the blocking schemes hook up with the different play calls, that is a massive accelerant. Like it it makes the likelihood that, that Ryan Grubb will be the best he can possibly be much higher. If he had to get some other offensive line coach, Ryan Grubb might be 70% of who he was in college, at least for some period of time until he got that same kind of chemistry with another offensive line coach. So I think that's massive. 
whoever the tight ends coach is, whoever the receivers coach is, like, sure, Sanjay Law, like, in DK Metcalf, there's some stories there that they were, he was a big part of his development and whatever. I, I, I don't think that's that critical. Like, I, I think you can have, you can much more just have guys that are functional position coaches and it doesn't really affect the offense. Uh, it's more just like a developmental kind of position. So that is huge news. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing that. Um, man, man, guys, this is <laughs> 1 a.m. and I'm still, I don't know if I'm real asleep. <laughs> this is huge. This is, well, I took a epic nap today. It was so good. It was only like an hour, but it was so good. Oh, it was such a, this week sucked with like Seahawks news. It was, just, it was crushing me. Like I, it was, it was driving you crazy. Brian, you, you messaged the group at like 6 a.m. one morning. You just said bored. I'm so <laughs> bored. It's like days go by with no news. And it's like, come on. I was, I come to the conclusion we were going to be waiting till after the Super Bowl. Like maybe there's people they wanted to talk to one of their staff. It's so funny, guys. Like all the fans that are trying to like say, hey, give us credit. We knew what was going to happen. We DM'd you. I've got just as many people that said, oh, they're not going to hire till next week because they're going to hire a guy off the uh, off one of the staffs in the Super Bowl. Like, I, I mean, whatever. I mean, <laughs> like most people just totally full of shit but you called it though you said it, you tweeted it out the other day like when all this grub alabama stuff was going on you said people are full of shit they don't know the I, is funny they've gone to yeah. such extents to be quiet throughout this whole process and then when they're gonna hire someone they get caught in a bar that was that's so true that is fuck that is a great point that is really funny and and then sound like surprised by it like yeah. it sounds like <laughs> on a friday night like <laughs> Well, I'll probably get shit for this, but I'm going to say it anyway, like I'm throwing roses, bouquets to a lot of uh, Seahawks fans on Twitter and, you know, UW fans on Twitter and all that kind of stuff and Whitney and all those things. I got to also just be a little critical of, of Seahawks media. Like yeah. I, I, par, I, I, I wasn't surprised that some fans were running with the grub is out of the running now that he's said he's OC to the boosters. I was surprised how many beat writers started writing articles that looks like grubs out of the running. What? Like you're professionals. Like you should know better than that. Like, unless someone's told you that. And based on what I had heard from anyway, it doesn't matter, but like it not, not a great look for, for Seattle beat writers in terms of breaking news on this stuff and how they've covered this particular search. Um, but thank God, you know, we don't have to totally rely on, on professional reporters. So I may that's... or may not get this job. <laughs> <laughs> Those are well, our, I told, you, I told you two weeks ago, Jeff, that this was, this was a possibility. So if, if, if folks don't know our favorite favorite tweets are people and we were going to not name names that are like as we mentioned as i mentioned this this is uh this is what was possible what could happen and invariably these are people that have told you every single possibility <laughs> grub is either going to be hired today or next week or he'll never be hired at all and then they reference back oh yeah see i told you that that could happen and like come on and we're oh, following how they're going through the ups and downs of the story. <laughs> and then they're like, uh, I don't know if I can trust this account, uh, but you know, maybe it's, <laughs> it's accurate. And like, you're doing what everyone else is doing. You're just, you're looking at tweets and you're trying to identify if they're accurate or not. And you know, don't, don't try to, don't try to pass it off. Come on, come on. Um, all right, I gotta, I got I can't, I can't do this to your, your, your bride, Jeff. We, we gotta let you go. <laughs> I'm gonna have. Um, <laughs> this was awesome. Thank you guys for coming on. Thanks to everybody uh, for listening. Uh, a lot of folks on the show. Um, give Jeff a follow at Real Jeff Simmons. Derek, thank you for joining at D E R Y C K G underscore D E R Y C K G underscore. Brian, um, I, I double checked my Twitter handle just to make sure when I typed it in. 
Uh, good. I, I, I had to double check where the where the underscore was. I, I would have I would have struggled. You and Cashman with your underscores. Um, and folks, if you haven't given the show a like, please do. I mean, this is uh, our Saturday night too, and or Friday night or whatever it is. Friday. And uh, appreciate it. And then uh, click the bell to get notified because we may do another pod tomorrow. To be totally honest, and that's the way you'll get notified. And then go to patreon.com slash hawk blogger sign up get immediate access to the slack channel where you too can uh continue the conversation with everybody else uh because the conversation is going to keep going and there's more news to be had and we're going to turn our attention to free agency we're going to turn our attention to draft all that and more coming up so patreon.com slash hawk blogger get access and support the show um as we support charity over two hundred sixty thousand dollars has been donated already Folks, you now have a badass coaching staff. Mike McDonald, Ryan Grubb, Leslie Frazier, Scott Huff. Like, let's go Arden dirty. Doing the doing everybody dirty. So let's just go. This is fun. And uh, appreciate y'all joining. Have a great rest of your night. Go Hawks. <laughs>